month ago, I was able to be on a civil rights immersion trip. We were in Birmingham, Alabama, and Montgomery, and then Selma. Really a life-altering trip in so many ways. So much that I had read about now being able to put my body in that exact place. Across the street from 16th Avenue Baptist Church, where the four little girls were killed by the bomb. There's a, what's called Children's Park. It's a huge park, and it's filled with incredible sculptures and art. It's the very place that the Children's March took place in Birmingham. And on the first night of the trip, we went to dinner, and we met Minister James, and Minister James was in seventh grade during the Children's March. And he told the story of multiple days of being beaten up and chased. And, but he told this one particular day, that iconic, remember that iconic photo of the hoses and the snarling dogs? He was in the park that day, and they brought out the hoses and the dogs, and he climbed a tree in the park. And he told us that he took off his belt and tied himself to the tree with his belt. So when the hoses hit him, he wouldn't fall out of the tree and be bitten by the dogs. Life had put him in that tree. And he was up there for his survival. Like Minister James, Zacchaeus was up a tree. He was above the fray, trying to rise above the crowd. His circumstances somehow that day led him. Maybe not so he could save himself, but maybe so that he, in a particular way, could be saved. He needed help, but maybe not for all the reasons you might think. I've been surprised by this story. I intended on surprising you, but I actually surprised myself, which was really fun. Because <laughs> I've known this story my whole life. From age four, Zacchaeus was a wee little man. <laughs> and a wee little man was he? No? Okay. <laughs> but I have a whole new understanding of this story today. I used to think of Zacchaeus kind of as an outcast, a despised and shady character, short in stature and no stature in the community. We've heard a lot about tax collectors because Jesus ate with them all the time, but he was a chief tax collector. He wasn't a pariah in the same way that the other tax collectors were. He was a man of means. Because the taxes were mainly on the wealthy because it was the wealthy who had money. There was no middle class and surely the poor had not many taxes to give. He was more like us, that is Zacchaeus, was more like us than we might have imagined. He was one of the wealthy, and they had to admit begrudgingly that he was one of their own. And in some ways, Zacchaeus had everything he needed, at least materially. He was secure. Yes, he didn't have the most admirable vocation, but many of us have vocations and jobs that conflict us at times, don't we? My job conflicts me at times. But he knew he needed something else. He was looking and searching and longing, and he wasn't afraid to go out on a limb. <laughs> Thank you. Just seeing if you're paying attention. But I want to suggest to you, and stay with me for a moment, I want to suggest to you a little different twist on the story that Phil had here. I want to suggest that actually Zacchaeus was doing pretty much everything right. I've always looked at this story as a type of conversion story, and I'm sure that transformation absolutely took place. Jesus comes to his house and he says, I will give half of my possessions. I will pay back. But actually, in the Greek, I've come to find out 
Why we have this translation in the future tense in the Greek, it was in the present tense. I give half my possessions. I pay back anyone that feels like I've cheated them. And maybe Jesus says, I want to meet you at your house. I want to find out more about who you are because surely you are a child of God, a son of Abraham. And I've come, I've come to seek what was lost. And what has been lost has been the heart of our faith. That is our interdependency and our sharing of possessions. Zacchaeus is doing everything right, I want to suggest. But still, he climbed a tree. He got above the fray, above the din, above the crowd, above the expectations, above the judgments. And it is then that he hears the voice of the divine. It is then that he accepts this invitation. Zacchaeus is us in so many ways. But how often do we get above the fray and accept that invitation of love? How often are we, like Zacchaeus, to be completely surprised and taken off guard and invite the unexpected into our lives, knowing that it could really change something. I want to suggest lovingly that even in our good works, being the good liberal Christians that we are, that nevertheless we have lost a part of ourselves. We've lost something soul-wise. Timothy Egan, who's a columnist for the New York Times, wrote yesterday, One Cure for Malnutrition of the Soul. I loved how he described it, malnutrition of the soul. He says, we are spiritual beings, but for many of us, malnutrition of the soul is a plague of modern life. That's one reason 200 million people worldwide a year make some form of religious pilgrimage. Let's just listen to the way he says it. In the vacuous tumult of the Trump era, I was looking for something durable, a stiff shot of no-nonsense spirituality. I am a skeptic by profession, an Irish Catholic by baptism, culture and upbringing. Laughs but listening like half of all Americans of my family's faith. Religion, he says, is a story, a narrative about a force much greater than us, enigmatic by nature. And he says, at the trail's end, following the footsteps of ten centuries of wanderers, the cynic in me had given way to something else. The history of organized religion and Christianity's dark decades of intolerance and cruelty is not reassuring, but faith is not so easily dismissed. I took to heart, he says, one bit of advice for pilgrims from Pope Francis, the pontiff who claimed the name of a 12th century pauper and mystic. Do we allow ourselves to be amazed, he said. Do we allow ourselves to be surprised? When's the last time somebody asked you, how are you? And you said, amazed. <laughs> Surprised. What I usually get from anybody that I run into, human beings in San Mateo County that I run into, how are you? Overwhelmed. Stressed. Tired. Oh, I'm so over the news. I'm over my phone and my email and the traffic. Everything is pressing in, like the crowds. Our lives are crowded with information, with worry. But I don't know about you, but way too often, I leave God out of the picture. I know it's my job. To put God in the picture. I 
but I'm like you. It's just too easy. So pressed in on at times to leave God or love or whatever name works for you out of the picture. As upper class, middle class, upper middle class people, we have a hard time admitting we have need. How many people find it very easy to just ask for help with something that they need? Okay. <laughs> and for the recording, those of you listening online, no one raised their hand. <laughs> but as my friend says, you'll never know God is all you need until God is all you got. But you know what? I don't want to get to that point. I don't want to get to a point where I got nothing. How about I invite God in before that moment? Many of you know I'm close friends with Pastor Bussey from the St. James AME Church. We spend as much time as we can together. You know, I just love her. You know, we don't think the same theologically about a lot of things. But I, I love her. And she'll say some things sometimes that I just wouldn't say, but when she says them, they make such sense. We'll be talking about a situation, she'll tell me something, and then she'll say, look what God did. And it could be something so simple. Just look what God did, she'll say. And it helps me remember to invite God, love, into the picture, because the truth is, I cannot do this on my own. I think I can, and I'm really good at solving situations, and I love to fix things. I cannot do this on my own. I cannot be the loving, justice-seeking, balanced, centered, full human being that I so long to be on my own. I cannot take the problems of the world on my shoulders on my own. I can't hold the grief and pain of people I love going through difficult things on my own. We are really good in this country, in this society, at self-help. Go to the library. There's a whole section. It's called self-help. <laughs> I don't know that there's a section called God help. But like Zacchaeus, we have to get above the fray and open enough of ourselves so that the light can enter. It doesn't matter whether you're short or tall, but we can be of small spiritual stature sometimes. And we need to get above the fray so that we can receive an invitation. What is it that you need to do to get above the fray? What invitation is waiting for you? Admitting need is not a mark of courage. It's not a mark of weakness. It's a mark of courage. And as the prayer says, courage comes from the heart. And we are always welcomed by God the heart of all being. Minister James, after he told us that story and the evening was over, he just said, I work the night shift at IHOP. Come on over and have dinner with me. And I'll tell you some more stories. 
Zacchaeus said to Jesus' self-invitation, okay, come on over. What invitation is waiting for you and waiting for me? And will we, like those two, say yes? Amen.